let's do one together. So watch as I do one because you're going to have to do another one next week on a different book. I'll do the Apaches. I'm going to log in, clicking the kids log in. If I see my teacher's username, I'm good. If not, it's tparodi0. Click your alpha. Type in your eight digit birthday and then click go. I'll update my password so then I don't have to remember that. Click on my assignment and I chose the Apaches and that's right here. I'm gonna click this one because I know I have to record myself reading. Let's familiarize, it's a hard one, ourselves with the question that will be asked. What facts did the author use to help you understand the life of this tribe? So I'm going to mark that one with, let's see, wasn't there stamps? Yeah. Facts. So I'm going to use an arrow for my facts. And then the last one says, how did their lives change over time? I will use a check mark or a smiley face. We'll figure it out when we go. Um, so those are the two reasons we're marking text, remember. And you do have to record yourself reading one page. So let's get that out of the way. One second. Okay. Ready, record. The Apache... Oh. <laughs> you have to pick your microphone. Share selected device. The Apache Village. To a 12-year-old boy from rural Missouri, the 1904 St. Louis World's Fair was a spectacle. Cool. Spectacle. An unusual or impressive object or event seen in public. Almost beyond belief, as he passed through the entryway with his parents, young Tom Richards gazed upon him. The Louisiana Purchase Exposition, he said, reading the official name of the fair. It had been 101 years since the United States had obtained the large the huge territory of Louisiana from France. The fair celebrated the, a century of progress since that time, a century in which the entire American continent had been settled. It was a warm September evening as the sky darkened. The fair glowed with electric light. On a huge lagoon at the center of the fairgrounds, boats glided by, filled with laughing people. Tom felt as though he was in an earthly paradise never had had he been so excuse me never had he seen so many beckoning attractions a person thing or type of entertainment that people enjoy cool and then i'm gonna hit stop so i've recorded myself reading i wrote the word recorded right here so the teacher knows to go back and look i'll come back over here so on this page, we haven't really learned anything about the Apaches yet. But again, remember the question is, what facts did the author use to help you understand the life of this tribe? And then how did their lives change over time? So there we go. Well, said Mr. Richards, as they walked along a crowded promenade, Promenade. Promenade. A public place for walking for pleasure or to be seen by others. What should we see first? How about the Palace of Machinery? His wife consulted a map of the fair. Well, we're closer to the Palace of Education, Mr. Richards shrugged. M Mrs. Richards looked down at Tom. What do you think, Tom? The boy was, wasn't was particularly, particularly interested in either of those suggestions. He wanted to see something exciting. As he looked around, he spied an attraction that ca caused his eyes to widen. There, that's where I want to go, he said, pointing to a colorful entrance on the pike, where cultures from around the world could be seen. The Apache Village, a banner above the entrance promised. Wild Indians, have your pictures taken with the infamous... Famous for being evil, bad, or dangerous. The infamous Chief Geronimo, 25 cents. Autographs, just 10 cents. Tom's mother was not enthused. I think we should see something more educational, she said. Tom's face dropped with disappointment. Tom's father stepped in to settle the disagreement. 
Listen, your mother and I will visit the uplifting Palace of Education and you will see the Apaches. Ignoring his wife's disapproving glare, he handed Tom some money. We'll meet you back here in an hour, eight o'clock sharp, sharp. Tom nodded happily and before there, and before there could be any dis further discussion on the matter, Tom was off to the Apache village. At the building's entrance, Tom bought a 25 cent ticket and passed through the admission gate. Inside, there was a recreation of an Apache settlement. Apache men and women in full tribal dress went about village life in front of dome shaped, so this is where we start highlighting, dome shaped dwellings called wickups. The women sewed buck skins or tended to pots of food simmering over small fires. So we'll do this part. So I'm just gonna do yellow for the facts that the author included to understand their life. And then we'll change the color if we see something that involves them uh, changing over time. A few men sat on buffalo robes making arrows while others groomed their horses. So making arrows is a good one. And then groomed horses. Next. Tom's attention was drawn to one of the, I'm gonna say it wrong, but wiki ups on the far side of the village exhibit. There, several dozen people were lined up at a small table. At the table, an old Apache man sat writing with a pencil. Two armed guards stood nearby. Wow, Tom exclaimed, that must be Geronimo. Geronimo, yeah, I see. It is indeed, said a man's voice. Tom looked around. A well-dressed gentleman, about 40 years old, smiled down at the boy. On his lapel was a badge that said, Official Guide. He extended his hand to Tom. John Collins, he said. Tom took the hand, the man's hand and shook it. I'm Tom Richards. Glad to meet you, Tom. Welcome to the fair. How would you like to learn about Geronimo and the history of the Apaches? Sure, said Tom, but I have to meet my parents in less than an hour. Well then, said Mr. Collins, I guess we better get started. The early days of the Apaches. Tom couldn't take his eyes off Geronimo. How come he has those guards standing near him, he said because he's a prisoner of war. A person captured and held by an enemy during war, said the guide, has been for close to 20 years now, but we'll get to his story in a minute. First, let's talk about his ancestors, the early Apaches. Mr. Collins led Tom to a wall of illustrations and photographs. Mr. Collins stopped at a map of North America, the Apache, the Apache people originally lived up in Canada. So we're gonna highlight that. This one might be over time how they changed. Oh, cool, you can just switch. Interesting. Then sometime after the year 1000, they started moving south along the east side of the Rockies. So that's all this. I don't like this highlighter that much. Mm, what if we, yeah, okay. He ran his finger down the map, but by the 1400s, they were living in what is, living in what is now Texas and Eastern New Mexico. They numbered, they numbered about 5,000. The Apache called themselves the Inde, the people. The name Apache comes from the Zuni Indian word Apuchu which means, which meant enemy. Obviously the Zunis didn't care much for them, eh? Mr. Collins took Tom to the next illustration. It was a painting of some men on horseback wearing strange looking metal helmets and armor. These are Spanish soldiers, the guide said. Life started changing in a major way for the Apaches and other Native, Ameri Native people when the Spanish began settling in the Americas in the 1500s. The Spanish brought horses, with them. So life is changing. And then it was the Spanish people that caused it to change in the 1500s. The Spanish brought horses with them. Indians had never seen horses before. They were afraid of them at first, but they soon obtained horses from the Spaniards and began 
became expert riders. The Apaches were among the first native people to use horses. Okay. The horse transformed the lives of the Indians throughout Central throughout Central North America. It enabled them to become nomads. They began to move far and wide hunting buffalo. So the horse is what changed them over time. And other animals. Some Apaches did a bit of farming, but most of them were strictly hunters. And I'm going to highlight the word nomads because on the FSA, you're supposed to use academic vocabulary, and they're teaching you this in this paragraph. So they became nomads. They began to move far and wide. They, so nomads are people that can, you know, move around in a space. They can move from place to place. The next illustration showed a Spanish mission, a center built by the Spanish in the New World to convert Native Americans to Christianity. Um, showed a Spanish mission. Life changed in other ways too, Mr. Collins said. Spanish settlers began moving into the Southwest in the 1600s and establishing towns and Catholic missions. So that's how life is changing for them. So 1600s, they were establishing towns and Catholic missions. The Apaches didn't want the Spanish taking their land, and they didn't want to become mission Indians. Didn't. This was the beginning of, near, of nearly 300 years of almost continual warfare. Yikes. Between the Apaches and people they considered invaders. First it was the Spanish, then the Mexicans, and finally the Americans. So we'll say Spanish, Mexicans, and Americans. Did they fight other Indians too? Tom asked. Oh yes, the guide answered with a sad smile. I don't think there was ever a tribe that didn't fight other tribes. One of the Apaches' main enemies was the Comanches. In the 1700s, the Comanches in Texas pushed many of the Apaches farther west. Those Apaches began settling in New, in western New Mexico and Arizona. So farther west by the Comanches. Next, Goya Flay. Became, becomes the Geronimo. That one's harder. There was a bright flash of light from the opposite side of the room. Tom looked around, startled. He saw Geronimo standing next to the young man in to next to the young man in front of the large camera on a tripod. A photographer was holding a smoke tray mounted on a handle. Flash powder, the guide said, lights everything up so you can take a picture inside. I want to have my picture taken with Geronimo, Tom said. I have the money. He pulled a quarter out of his pocket and held it up. Well, there's still a line, but while you're waiting, let's talk about Geronimo. We're coming to the part of the, that part of the story now. Mr. Collins led Tom to another picture. There shows how Geronimo might have looked as a young man, he said. He was called Goyathe, Goyathle, which means he who yawns. Funny name, huh? Not too scary. This man... This shows him in 1858 when he was about 29. By 1858, the Spanish were long gone, Mr. Collins said. Mexico was an independent nation, and, so and the Southwest was made up of states and territories of the United States. Goyathe was a member of the Chir okay, Chiricahuas, Chiricahuas, a group of Apaches that lived mostly in the territory that would become Arizona. The Chiricahuas were pretty much at peace with everyone at that time. They sometimes made trips to Mexico to trade with the Mexicans. On one of those trips, Goyfle came back to his camp and found that Mexican soldiers had murdered his mother, wife, and three children. From that moment on, Goyfle had a vicious hatred of Mexicans. He wanted revenge, but he was a religious man, so he went up into the mountains to pray and meditate. As he started up, as he stared up at the starry sky, Goethe heard a message, no gun can ever kill you. I will take the bullets from the guns of the Mexicans. I'll read that last. That message from the Apache god, Usun, 
gave Goyathle unlimited courage, said Mr. Collins. He led bands of Apaches in frequent raids across the Mexican border. He absolutely terrorized Mexican soldiers. Tom pictured the scene in his mind. Seeing the implacable, I want to hear it. Implacable. Good. Incapable of being soothed or softened. Seeing the implacable hatred in the eyes of the attacking Apaches, the Mexican troops dropped to their knees and wailed, San Geronimo, San Geronimo, but their cries did them no good. The Apaches killed them without mercy. San Geronimo, that's Spanish for Saint Jerome, their patron saint, saint, patron saint, a holy person recognized as the special protector of a person or group. Goithle took the name for himself. He became Geronimo. And we'll look at this. Apache religion. The Apaches believed in a god of the universe whom they called Usin, the one who knows. They also believed in spirits that dwelled. So this is information you should highlight. They also believed in spirits that dwelled in the mountains. They thought those spirits had taught their ancestors how to live. The Apaches believed in life after de death. And let's highlight spirits in the mountains. Um, but Geronimo said he had no idea what the afterlife would be like. Cochise War. Mr. Collins showed Tom a picture of another Apache leader. This is Cochise, he said. Although Geronimo was making a name for himself, it was Cochise who was the chief of the Chiricahuas, and he was keeping the peace with the Americans. Then, in 1861, a young army lieutenant named George Bascom did a really stupid thing. He accused Cochise of a crime he didn't commit and tried to arrest him. Cochise escaped, but he was wounded. Three of Cochise's male relatives, who were being held by the army as hostages, were hanged. Mr. Collins shook his head in dismay. As a result of this tragic incident, Cochise went on the war path against the Americans. For the next 10 years, the Chiricahuas attacked settlers and wagon trains and fought battles with the United States Army. The army was determined to end the Apache uprising. The guide related, in 1871, the army sent General George Crook to capture Cochise and his warriors. General Crook was an experienced Indian fighter, and he was determined to capture Cochise, but another army officer, General Oliver Otis Howard, beat him to it. In September 1871, Cochise met Howard in the mountains of Arizona. Cochise was now 60, 60 years old, and he was tired of fighting. He said he would surrender if the Chiricahuas could have a reservation in their homeland in the southeast, in southeastern Arizona. General Howard consented to the request, and Cochise agreed to settle his people on this reservation. So that ended Cochise's war. Geronimo's desperate resistance. Well, back to Geronimo, said Mr. Collins. He took Tom to another picture. This was of Geronimo kneeling with his rifle. This is the Geronimo who made Americans and Mexicans shake with fear. This photo was taken later in his life, after he had been captured for the last time. But he still looked fierce, didn't he? He sure did, Tom agreed. When Kachai surrendered to Howard, all the Chiricahuas, including Geronimo, went to live on the Apache reservation. It had been, I'm going to, um, that's a change over time, I think. So it went to live on the Apache reservation. So they went from like being nomads going all over the place and now they're living on one specific place called a reservation. It had been established exactly where Kachai's had requested, but that was valuable land and lots of white people wanted it. So what do you suppose happened? I think I could guess. <laughs> Tom took a guess. The Cherokawas got moved someplace else. You are correct, said the guide. Yes, after Kachais died in 1874, the government forced the Cherokawas to move to the San Carlos Reservation. It was a terrible place out in the desert. Hmm. So I'm going to highlight that. Mr. Collins took out a pocket watch. When do you have to meet your parents? At 8 o'clock, Tom said. Good, you have another 15 minutes to spend. And we're already nearing the end of the story. He put his watch back in his pocket. So where were we? 
San Carlos, several tribes of Apaches had been sent to that godforsaken reservation. Most of them no longer had any fight left in them, but the Chiricahuas still had plenty of fight. They decided they would rather die in battle than waste away on a dry, scorching reservation. So Geronimo and some other Chiricahua leaders escaped with their followers and returned to the mountains. That was the start of a new round of warfare and terror. 